You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Manzanero. So, Phil, is this book something you've been meaning to do for years and only got round to during COVID or anything like that? No, not at all. No. <laughs> no, it, um, it's something that um, I've been thinking about because... I come from a very large uh, Colombian family on my mother's side, and there's 50, were 50 cousins. And I thought it would be interesting for them to know uh, where we came from. That's one thing. And along the way, I, I thought um, I needed to make sense of the life that I've lived from the beginning, which we'll talk about later. And also try and make sense of Roxy, seeing as that we, a couple of years ago, did our farewell tour. So, you know, just looking back on that and uh, having a few thoughts about that. But um, it it didn't uh, happen during lockdown because um, I did three albums with Tim Finn. Right. So music. Just the three. Just the three. Well, he had nothing to do. In, he was locked down in New Zealand. So, yes. So, you know. Um, but uh, it's something I, I, I sort of started um, about seven years ago, really. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot, had to do a lot of interviews over the years. And I'd tell a few of the stories. And, and the journalists would say, oh, you must write a book. So um, I thought... Yes, I must write a book. And then um, I tried doing it, and I tried. I, I wrote a couple of chapters, and uh, I realised how incredibly difficult it is to be. A Thank writer. you. <laughs> <laughs> writers get a bit of respect on yeah. that. Well, Phenomenal writers artwork. have really risen totally, in my <laughs> estimation. Not only for the fact that it's so difficult to write unless you've got this gift, which you guys obviously have. Um, but also, um, uh, you know, the, the publishing industry. Oops, I, better not. <laughs> I probably shouldn't go there. That's worse than the record industry in terms of paying, you know, writers and things. So God knows how they earn a living. Um, but no, it, it, uh, it may, it's really made me appreciate what they do. The other interesting thing that I, I've discovered is that it seems terribly unfair. You know, musicians sometimes can write a tune in like 10 minutes and, well, we've all seen McCartney on Let It Be and stuff, you know, um, uh, amazing songwriters. And um, writers spend, you know, years and years writing and complicated plots and all this kind of thing. And then people read the book maybe once or maybe twice at the most. You know, musicians, they maybe write something in a few minutes and they're still listening. Being You're listening still writing right. years later. Thousands of times, that's true. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's terribly unfair, isn't it? <laughs> it, is. it is. We'll forgive you. Uh, but, but one thing you've got on your side with this project is you've got your own photos and you've got your own family photos here, which is obviously, as you say, the book is, is partly a family story as well as a musical story. Uh, and we're looking now at pictures of, her, I think, your mother and father on the wedding day and, uh, and you with, uh, with siblings. So you, you were born where? Well, I was, you'd think I was born in South America, wouldn't you? But in fact, I was born... You couldn't, my dad used to say, but a Colombian mother, a British father, that picture is in Barranquilla on the Colombian Caribbean coast. Um, but in fact, I was born opposite the Houses of Parliament in, in St. Thomas's Hospital. And my dad used to say, when we were living in Cuba and Venezuela, you, you, you're a cockney, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're within the sound of bow bells. Don't come with your exotic airs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't come with the Cuban you know, mojitos or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, thinking about it now, I guess I'm mixed race. You know, my mum was Colombian. My dad was British, um, sent out there in, in, during the Second World War, 1941, uh, working for the British Council. Right. And uh, my mum was a student. Having said that, she was 21, and he was 29, so it's not 
Like right, that, right. Really. And he got a job as he was working for BOAC, wasn't he? And, and well, therefore, no, at, at that point, he worked for the British Council. Yeah. And you know, um, he had tried to enlist and was turned down a few times. And a lot of uh, people who want to contribute to the war effort ended up being sent all over the world to sort of um, exercise soft power, which they call with the British Council. <clears throat> and, you know, first of all in Colombia, and then in Argentina at a very crucial point in the Second World War when Peron was uh, flip-flopping uh, and we were getting all our food from... Um, Frey Bentos. Frey Bentos, oh. corned corn beef. <laughs> yeah, delicious stuff. Yeah. Um, I used to dream about it in South America. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I came back to England. Um, but, uh, yeah, the U-boats were, like, downing uh, all the British ships. And, um, you know, the, so it was very important for uh, British culture to try and succeed over, from, you know, in the British Council, uh, win over from the Goethe Institute, who were there, trying to, you know, big up the German, the Nazis. And... Um, Anyway, I, I think I digress. I, I was talking about so, the so book. You, so you, you went back, but, but then you, your father is posted to Cuba, yes? Well, they, they come back to England. My, my brother was born in Argentina. My, my sister gets born here in Gravesend. My mum comes to live at Gravesend, hardly speaking English at all. It's a total fish out of water. And... Uh, then he uh, um, joins an airline company, which was initially called British South American Airways, and became BOAC, British Overseas Airways Corporation, owned by the government. And then he gets sent to Havana, Cuba, 1957, taking along the little Philip boy uh, from Clapham. We're looking at a picture of him here, looking oh, rather yeah. like, looking like Tony Soprano. That's, right. uh, 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 that, that's uh, Zorro. Uh, that's no, Zorro. you're on the right, looking like Zorro. I, I was talking about your, your father here. Yes, actually, you're right. <laughs> that, that's um, my mum with um, Franca, who's an Italian lady, who started having guitar lessons, and that's why I started playing the guitar because of those two ladies. But me dressed up, when I saw that recently, I thought, it looks quite similar to an outfit the Brown Ferry wore. Absolutely. <laughs> In 1974. Definitely. I thought the same thing. Well, Brown Ferry used to be depicted as a member of the Lone Groover cartoon. <laughs> you know. yeah, that's right. Well, actually, we were talking about Ian MacDonald before, who was assistant editor of the NME. And, of course, uh, famously, they, uh, Ian, who was a very good friend of mine, at the time, uh, as well, a school friend and assistant edit editor of the enemy put that picture of Brian uh, with a terrible sort of comment underneath it about the gaucho. Yes. <laughs> it caused me a lot of trouble in the, in the we, band. We must ask you about the, the, the revolutions. You were in, in, in Cuba before 1959, before the revolution, and you talk about it being the fashionable place where uh, Sinatra was going there and Churchill and all sorts of people. And you can remember, can't you, when the revolution happened and your house was burgled, I think, or looted. Tell us about that. Okay, I, I don't know if anyone's seen The Godfather Part Two. <laughs> yeah, I think we've all seen Godfather. <laughs> okay, well, I rewatched it at Christmas, and um, in that, you get a snapshot of exactly what it was like when I was when we were living there. And that particular night, uh, uh, New Year's Eve, when uh, Castro finally broke through in a place called Santa Clara, which is halfway along Cuba, uh, and uh, they, the game was up with the dictator, Batista. And in the film, you can see them getting the, the report from one of their people saying, oh, he, he's on his way into Havana, let's get the hell out of here. And they all leave to go to the military airport, which was just around the corner from our house. Simultaneously, while this New Year's Eve sort of party was going on, in our garden, there was a gun battle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and they were attacking uh, the house opposite, which was the house of the chief of staff of the dictator. And uh, so we were um, 
on the bathroom floor with my mother screaming and, and pushing our faces into the mosaic uh, floor. It, incidentally, I've been back to the house. We've been back to the house, me and Claire, and, um, and also <coughs> with my children as well, one of whom's here tonight, and, um, and seen the bathroom floor and everything. And then, um, you know, all the guards... Uh, with their hands up, we saw them through the window, and then... And you were how old then? I was seven. Right. That, seven turning on eight. And um, so, the, you know, they scarpered, and, and uh, Fidel came in. I watched it on the telly, on top of tanks and everything. And then um, the next morning, these trucks appeared with merch for the kids, little hats and uh, armbands and stuff like that. And I think there's a picture uh, in the book, actually, of me with a, what they call a barbudo, a guy with a big beard, looks like sort of Woody Allen type of character, <laughs> joking, <laughs> with a machine gun, you know, and um, he was guarding the house. And uh, he let me go in because it had been looted. And I went in and took a whole bunch of stuff. One of... One of the things is the gold epaulets of the general's um, white dinner jacket, which I have in my music room. Still, <laughs> I look at it every day. <laughs> and 303 shells, things that little you know, kids like to sort of give you a big bag of 303 shells and a photo album uh, with lots of pictures of uh, British Air Force people with uh, the dictator's... Um, Generals and they're obviously selling them planes and things, you know, right. which I've, I haven't really read about anywhere. But mysteriously, that photo album has disappeared. So, so it's fair to say it was a, it was a more colourful childhood than most British rock musicians could claim. I, th- I guess you could. But why th- after that was there, and then uh, well, Venezuela? Well, yes, I mean one. Just before we leave Cuba, I recently also watched. Um, a film called Our Man in Havana by Graham Greene. Yes, yes. I don't know if any of you have seen yes. that. Lovely black and white film with Noel Coward and Alec Guinness. In it. Very funny film, actually. It's actually filmed a month after we left Cuba. Actually filmed on location in Havana. Castro allowed it to happen. And um, I, when I watched it the other day, I was forgetting about watching the narrative. I was looking behind them to see if I recognised places, which I did, yeah. actually, and yeah. stuff like that. But yes, then it became too dangerous for foreigners to be in Havana because there's so much looting and stuff. And we, um, we, we went to New York, and on the plane... Uh, again, I have all this sort of in pictures. I have the plane of the propellers out the window of the plane as we flew to New York, and then footage of me walking down Fifth Avenue in 1959, um, February. And my dad came into the hotel and said, we were actually watching a program on the telly of people surfing in Hawaii. <laughs> and he said, I said, where are we going? Let's go there. <laughs> said, we're going to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so Waikiki. We're, we're looking at pictures here of, uh, you know, of various... Um, old family, um, you know, hijinks. And uh, one picture here at the bottom bottom left here, that's actually you on the uh, opposite the place called Diamond Head, which is... Waikiki Beach? It, at the end of Waikiki Beach, yes. yes. I, I got sent to a sort of Catholic school, they're nuns, and... Um, but it, I think it used to finish about 3 o'clock and I'd get on a bus and meet my mum at Waikiki Beach and uh, take out a big surfboard, get hit on the head by it, and uh, slightly dangerous. Um, there was only one hotel on Waikiki Beach there. Now it is absolutely rammed with hundreds of hotels. And um, you know, years later, I brought out a solo album, I called it Diamond Head. Yeah. And that's exactly why I called it Diamond Head. Yeah. You know, it's an instrumental. I'm going to play it tonight. And, um, you know, it's... People probably thought, why is that album called Diamond Head? And if, in fact, you know, when you're trying to give a, a title to an instrumental, 
Well, you could choose anything you like, really. So most of my instrumentals relate... To childhood and... The, childhood and the places that I've lived in and, and things like that, yeah. This is the point in the story where it... Oh, well, actually, we've got a, a swift diversion to take in your... We uh, had to ask you about this. We had to ask you about the, uh, getting the autograph of this fabulous lady. Tell us the story. Well, that's Vivian D. And um, <clears throat> she came to Caracas with that touring company, the old Vic company, uh, and uh, they did Macbeth and, and, and things like that. I remember going to see it. But because my dad was, um, well, let's face it, he started out as a sort of wannabe actor in London, uh, and he was in one of the first ever Ealing films. Oh, actually, really? Which... Strange enough, we, we bought a copy of it on Amazon and stopped it where we saw him. He was an extra only. But, you know, it's one of the first ever Ealing films. And uh, age 24, he was the um, stage manager of the Colosseum, just around the corner from here, really. And so he already... And, and being in the British Council, he was always involved with actors. And so he could, get, he could get backstage, couldn't he? He could, yes. And, uh, you know, occasionally we would watch films and he'd say, oh, I know that guy, you know, uh, he was an extra or something. He was the third spear from the left. Yeah. You know, uh, and um, anyway, they came to Venezuela and he threw a party for them. In fact, I've got it on Super 8 footage in the, in the round a pool with all... Robert Helfman was another great character from that period. And... Um, and lots of footage, super eight footage of her climbing on there. And that, that's her aut aut yes. autographing a program or whatever for, uh, for you. Yes. Now, this is the point in the story where we go back to rainy old England, you know. <laughs> really, the story ought to turn into black and white at this point. Because <laughs> you oh, yeah. you, you're, you're, you're back home. Are you sent back to go to go school? It's, um, you know, I'd been to like four schools in 18 months, you know, in Cuba, Hawaii, Venezuela, and then eventually um, I arrive in South London. And one of them, at this point, I'd become obsessed by guitars and music. And in fact, walking here today, it reminded me of the amount of time I used to spend in. Tottenham Court Road and Charing Cross Road, walking up and down, aged 11 onwards, uh, dreaming, yeah. looking into those guitar shops that are just around the corner. In fact, I went for a walk around them quite a, just now. There are a few of them have disappeared, actually. Didn't they confiscate your guitar at school? <laughs> I don't know how this happened, but I was aged 10. I got a £5... Uh, note for my birthday and uh, I, I found a shop in Surbiton called Bell's Musical Instruments where you could put down a deposit of five pounds for a Hofner Galaxy red Hofner Galaxy guitar which I drooled over in a catalogue <clears throat> which I did and then um, appeared to sign a higher purchase agreement <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I had no idea what I, I purchased. Going on. Obviously, I got a solicitor's letter um, a month later, and so I had to go to get on the plane because we had free flights there because my dad worked for the airline. Go back to Venezuela uh, with this guitar uh, and this solicitor's letter. Um, my dad was allowed to come on the plane, to me, and I sort of looked at him coming towards me, and I just showed him. <laughs> The letter burst into tears, obviously. And, um, and he said, oh, God, what the hell is it? He sort of, we got back home, and um, he said, oh, OK, we'll just plug it in then. And he thought you plugged it into the wall. You know, it was an electric guitar, so you plug. He said, oh, no, you need an amplifier. And uh, it exploded again, you know. And he eventually did get me an amplifier. But uh, the reason why... Uh, I was obsessed as well, was because when I was at the school in Venezuela, me and my Venezuelan friends, 
and it was a mixed school. We used to go to parties, and there was a lot of dancing going on, even though we were the age. Yeah. Is that a fire? Or was it... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it does sound like it. Yeah. Recorded near here. Um, and uh, these American college kids would come over and they'd be playing uh, Buddy Holly and they had electric guitars. So we looked at each other. We could see our girls from our class like looking at these American boys and say, we got we got to tool up. We've got to get electric guitars. Yeah. You know, so this is all part of the master plan. Send me to England. Well, where I can get some, electric guitars. We're looking at some pictures of you in the school groups here. Um, just oh, tell us very Hoff- briefly about these, the, the two bands that, that you that's were in. The, yes, yeah, so that's the Hofner Galaxy that um, I managed to buy on HP, age 10 or 11, um, which I still have, which is absolutely brilliant guitar. Um, yeah, and, and with, you know, it was all about, you know, I arrive in September 1960 in London and everything kicks off. You know, the Beatles turn up, the Stones turn up, the Kinks, the Who, everybody at school, it's like we must form a band. You know, so that was the first iteration. I love the idea that you've thoughtfully autographed yes. it for your adoring fans. <laughs> a- yeah, aged I, I, about, what, 12, 13 or something. It is signed, well, which is fantastic. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's very conceited, isn't it? But, <laughs> no, and obviously it nobody wanted it because you still got it. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the group called? Uh, yeah, OK, well... You know. No, no. <laughs> yeah, what was it called? Oh, yes. It was called the Drag Alley Beach Mob. And I'll tell you why. Because, obviously... I, the Beach Boys were like, I was coming from like American influence type thing, the Beach Boys, and you know, drag. And racing. you'd been surfing, which And I've would... been surfing, actually been surfing, so surfing USA, yeah. You're right. So um, it didn't last very long that bad. <laughs> right. But the other group, Who with the Ostrich Feather, I think it was called, wasn't it? Can you remember any of the song titles or the things, the, the um, self-composed classics? Yeah. Trumpets with motherhood. Oh, okay, <laughs> that was one. Now, to be fair, the person who thought of that name became the assistant editor of the NME. Oh, there you go. Yeah. We were just mere puppets. He was like four years older than us. That's Bill McCormick's brother in uh, his book name was Ian McDonald. Um, but he was a sort of Spengali who said, I think you should, I've got a name for you. And in fact, he thought of the next name, Quiet Sun, as well. Um, he was like a sort of guru. Right, right. <laughs> mentor, really. Um, oh. So they, there we're looking at a picture of Quiet Sun. So that's your first kind of proper group who actually signed to Island Records. Well, actually, it didn't sign to I famously have a letter from Muff Winwood, uh, who was at Island Records at the time, saying... This band has absolutely no commercial potential. <laughs> <laughs> well, your pal Richard Williams, the writer, had uh, you, you played him the tape, didn't you, and, and sent him a little package. And I think he'd said that the best thing about this group is the press release, written yeah. in fact by Ian McDonald. By, by Ian McDonald, yeah. yes. And in fact, it was because of um, uh, that band uh, giving up, basically, because Bill McCormick joined a band with Robert Wyatt called Matching Mole. Um, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? You know, he's now a professional musician, he's my best friend, you know. Um, he said, well, there's this band who sent in a tape to Richard the, the week before called Roxy. They're looking for a guitarist, why don't you apply? We should read out, actually, uh, we're looking at it now, we should read out the advert that appeared, I think, in the, in the Melody, was it? Melody Maker. It says, the perfect guitarist for Avil Rock Group. Original, creative, adaptive, melodic, fast, slow, elegant, witty, scary, stable. Quality musicians only. Ring Roxy 223-0298. Fantastic. Yeah, I thought, tick, tick, tick. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love you, man. Fast, slow is a great moment in that. Uh, yeah. Did you turn up in the doorway and say, I'm here? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny enough, that phone number... Andy Mackay and Brian Ferry used to rent a working man's cottage in Battersea 
and that was their phone number. That's right, so I did. I turned up, and um, there they were. Well, walked into the room, there's Eno, Brian Ferry, Andy Mackay, and the, the original bass player, Graham Simpson. And um, I've been in this prog rock band, basically, you know, quite some playing complicated music, six bars of 17-8 then and a bar of 13-8 and <laughs> no, nothing in 4-4 four, four. and then uh, they said okay let's have a jam and it was just two chords and in 4-4 four, four, I think it could have been a Carol King number or something yeah. I thought this is heaven I'm waiting for my man yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah should have been waiting, waiting for my man um, and I thought freedom at last and uh, so you know the, the minute I saw them I thought these guys are special. They, there's something about them. They're, they're different to other musicians I've met in London. And uh, they were about four years older than me. They'd all been to university. Right. They had jobs. They had a car. Well, they had a mini. Um, they had bank accounts. <laughs> they, Seriously? I mean, this was a, yeah, it, this it was, was a very, van stuff at the time, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, they, they'd bought their own... P- mini PA, you know, where they borrowed money to... So I thought, these guys are really... And then I remember talking to Brian about films and things like that, and it was all going so well, and, th- and then I discovered I'd failed the audition. <laughs> <laughs> and who got the job? Davey O'List, was it? Who got... Dave O'List, yes. who was a fantastic guitarist who played in a band called Night, The Nice, and I'd been... I'd seen them play... There was a famous tour um, that eventually reached England with Jimi Hendrix, the original Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett, Amen Corner, yes. and The Nice with Dave O'List. And they toured in America, and they came and played at the Albert Hall. I went to see it, and they were absolutely terrific. So I thought, well, they've got Dave O'List. My, he's famous already, and... Fair play, you know, he's, he's great. I loved his playing. Um, but he didn't, uh, it just didn't work out. He, uh, the story is that on that American tour, he'd been spiked with acid and stuff, and he just never recovered. And uh, tragedy, really. But um, so he wasn't very reliable. So you got a call back? I, I got a, for some bizarre reason, I was with Richard Williams in a sort of bingo hall watching um, the, embry, you know, the, the proto Roxy do an audition for the management company. I, I can't really, I must ask Richard, why was I there? I don't, I don't know. We were sat there and these two characters turned up from EG Management and that was David Enthoven who went on to manage Robbie Williams. Yeah. And at the time managed King Crimson and T-Rex, actually, and Mark Fennick, who uh, was the sort of tour manager for ELP at that time, uh, but now is the manager of Roger Waters. And um, anyway, they went on and they played some numbers, <clears throat> but just before they played, there was an altercation between Dave O'List and the drummer Paul Thompson. I, my story is that they had a punch up there. And as Mark Fennick left, I heard him say, get rid of the guitarist. <laughs> uh, and so I got a call a few weeks later, supposedly to come and mix the sound. So I, I was working, I did have a job. I worked as a temp at Clarkson's, the travel company in the East End. Uh, and everyone was a temp there. And, and they were attempting to discover why Clarkson's had lost a million quid. And they were all temps. And they were just like throwing airplane darts around and all this. Anyway, the phone rings. And my mother's saying, oh, there's a call from this guy called Brian uh, Ferry. Can, can you ring him back? So I rang back. And, and then Brian said, look, um, would you like to come mix the sound? And I said, Really? Mix the sound, because Eno used to mix the sound in the audience. I mean, when I say audience, the gigs were like the size of this room. But Eno would be out there, and everyone would be coming up and poking his VCS3 and saying, Ooh, what's that do? And, all that. <laughs> and he, he wasn't allowed to be on stage because he made everyone else too nervous. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, anyway. And upstaged them, probably. Yeah, so, so he said, um, come, Ina will show you how to mix the sound. I said, really? So I, I turned up into this sort of derelict house, which had electricity in, just off Portobello Road. And I turned up and they said, oh, Dave's not here. His guitar's said, you fancy having a go? And I sort of had an inkling this might happen, so I actually secretly learned all their numbers. Yeah, there you go. And then I said, you show me how to play the number. They play it once. I said, right. I've got, got it. it. Got let's, it. Let's, let's <laughs> it. I'll just, take it from here. What a quick <laughs> We played all the numbers, and they said, would you like to join? <laughs> and that was, I think, that was uh, two days after my 21st birthday. And the, the rock, first Roxy contract, so my birthday's on 31st of January. 2nd of February, I get the nod. 14th of February, we sign the first Roxy Music contract. Um, a month later, having done three gigs, we're in recording the first album. Three months later, it comes out on the same day as Bowie's Ziggy Sardas and is in the charts. So it just like... I was just in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and, the gr- and the group were kind of... You were kind of hot, hot stuff from the early... From even before having a record out, because I remember reading Richard's piece in The Melody Maker about that. Yeah. Or do it, that show in a bingo hall or... or oh, what, really? What, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was... Uh, I think you're right. That's right, because he was a big... Kesso, a big cheese in, in the melody maker, yeah, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. He was a, you know, still is a very serious sort of music. Uh, yeah. So tell us about those early gigs. What were they like with Roxy Music? It all happened very quickly, didn't it? Well, in fact, we're looking at a ticket now of you uh, supporting David Bowie at, at the Rainbow. Well, actually, we did support him at the Rainbow, but before that... We supported him it was at Greyhound, wasn't it? the Greyhound yeah. in Croydon, a pub in, in Croydon. And there's someone here tonight who actually helped put up the posters <laughs> for that gig, Stuart Preble. I, I think you're here, Stuart, aren't you? Yes. And yes, big, big. <laughs> not only. He's waited a long time for that round of applause. <laughs> Come on, guys. But it, it, Stuart is crucial to this book because he is the person who helped me, you know, get it down, as, uh, along with Claire, my wife, in, in the sense that they produced me. You know, I'm a producer of, of musicians and albums and things like that. But to write a book, I needed two people to, produ- <laughs> to produce me, you know, because I can tell these stories, but it's different when you see it on a page. Yeah, you get yeah. it down in a, in a proper way. And by complete coincidence, I met Stuart... And it turned out he had helped his brother, who was a promoter of that gig. And that's how I first met David Bowie and and then the Spiders. And I I turned up early, uh, ahead of the band, because um, uh, I I knew someone around there. And um, I walked up, and there they were, all sat on chairs, an empty room, an empty room, and you've got... David and Spiders from Mars, and they're all dressed exactly as they are on stage. And I thought, wow, they really dress like that <laughs> the, the whole time. <laughs> and we just put on our stage clothes, uh, like theatre, <laughs> sort of thespians, uh, and muck about with makeup. But this guy is actually living the dream. But it's an you know, incredibly great meeting. And he was so kind to us, and he invited us. Uh, to play with him at the Roundhouse, uh, at um, the Rainbow, Rainbow, yeah, Rainbow, yeah. Yeah. Rainbow yeah. Theatre, yeah. So they, so Roxy Music's first album, you know, you, you touched on that, you know, the, the the importance of the kind of the visual side of it, which Anthony Price obviously did the cover and so forth. Yeah. But you are pictured inside as are the other members with looks that are, were quite striking at the time. And, and, the, and your bug spectacles are on the cover of this book, you know. So, Indeed. So well, that, that became that your Price's trademark. Idea, <laughs> wasn't it? it was, wasn't it his idea? He said, you put these on, try that out. Basically, remember I've got a South American mother. My father died by this stage. And I'm living with, at my mum's house in Clapham. 
and they say, right, it's a photo session. And, and you know, you're talking about people who studied, you know, under Richard Hamilton, mm -hmm. eminent British pop artist, and the height, knew all the fashionistas in London. And, and I'm a guy who, you know, was at Dulwich College and then had a clummy mother, and we said, well, what am I going to wear to the to the shoot and she's sort of sews on a few Diamante stars onto a white shirt. I get on like the 137 bus and go up to town and come into the photo shoot and there's Anthony Bryce, you know, and he looks at me and goes, oh my God. <laughs> what are we, you know, I've got the long hair and I've got the beard and everything. So what are we gonna do? He, he gets these bug eyes and I stick those on he gets that black leather jacket, stick that on, you're done. Right. <laughs> Paul Thompson, right. You know, what are we going to do with you? You know. What a uh, formative moment in your life that was. Absolutely. Though, it? It's incredible, really, because then you looked like that for the next, God knows how many years, you know. Many, many years. My memory. In fact, uh, about two years ago, Brian, um, Anthony was over, because he lives in Sicily, and he, he was staying at Brian Ferry's house. And um, I sat down with him and said, you know, I've just got to thank you so much Anthony you know you were so crucial to the whole launch of Roxy and the image you know it's, as part of a team obviously with Brian and Nick DeVille and everything but and th those amazing photographers but it was definitely a team work and he was so important to that whole idea of that initial Roxy which really create, created an incredible impression and, uh, you know, our appearance on Top of the Pops is often cited by lots of people saying that it gave them permission to be way out and just to express themselves, who they were and stuff like that. And Can you remember your first Top of the Pops appearance? Uh, yeah, totally, because it... it um, well, it's on, you know, YouTube and stuff like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I've obviously been able to see it, but... When you look at what we were wearing, and I mean, Eno looks like he comes from the planet Zod or something, you know. <laughs> and then you, they pan to what the audience were wearing. It was just like literally light years away. Um, so, you know, it was that idea of doing interesting music but presenting it in an attractive fashion and coming back to a bit of entertainment really, and showbiz-type sort of look, um, which was blended with pop art and stuff like that, which had disappeared from pop music yeah. by the end of the 60s. And most of the big bands had been swept up in a sort of wave of drugs and heroin and, and shoegazing and introvert. <laughs> and then Bowie and us appeared with sort of, hello... Were the new kids on the block type of thing. Yeah. And well, it, it was glam, but I often discuss this with, with Bowie, and he said, yeah, but Phil, there's high glam and low glam. <laughs> we were high glam. <coughs> well, the rest were low glam. <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.